want to welcome you to Millen Baptist Church and we're going to continue our journey through the glorious uh, gospel of John. We're in the middle of a series where we're highlighting the story of John chapter 4 and Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well, but we're specifically looking at that story through the lens of sharing our faith in Jesus. And Jesus is always our example in life of what it's like to share and to witness. And so we find him here in this story sharing himself with uh, the Samaritan woman at the well. And again, as we go through this story, we're going to look at this story through this lens. Specifically, we're going to do that because God has a calling on your life. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he has a calling on my life as a believer in Jesus Christ. And in Matthew um, chapter 4, verse 18, when Jesus is calling the disciples, he says, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. And so God has called all believers in Jesus Christ to be fishers of men, every single one. So it's not a question of whether or not we've been made a fisher of men, and whether or not God wants us to share our faith with other people, but it's only a question of whether we fish or not. Also, we notice here in this slide that Jesus demonstrates uh, for us that he is committed. Uh, in this passage here with the Samaritan woman, we'll be reminded as we uh, start here our second session on this story that Jesus is committed and had to pass through Samaria. And he had to because he had an appointment that he wanted to keep with this individual woman. Now, if you could go ahead, if you've got your Bible there with you, um, either on your screen or certainly your paper copy, which is amazing. Uh, John chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 42 is where we will be. And the location that's being spoken of specifically in this section is uh, the town of Sakar, or the area of Shechem where Jacob's well was. And this is a photo that uh, my wife and daughter and I just took recently when we were in Israel. We're standing up on Mount Gerizim, a mountain that will be mentioned uh, as we journey through this story. This is the city of Shechem down below. Uh, here's the remains of the tell of Shechem where the ruins of Shechem are. Over here is where Jacob's well is located. And then right over here, uh, is the town of Sakar, where this woman is walking from to get to this well. Now, with that being said, uh, let me pray, and then we'll begin our journey. Father, bless our time today in your word. Move in power, Jesus. Use your word, God, to draw me uh, to draw those, Lord, who are here and who listen. Use it to draw us closer to you, Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to spend time in your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. As a reminder of what we covered in part 1. You can listen to part 1 if you'd like to on our Facebook channel for Millen Baptist, or you can certainly listen to it on the Basin Youth for Christ uh, YouTube page as well. Now, when Jesus learned that the, the, that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea. He departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. He was committed. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, right here next to Shechem, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. It's right over here. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now for a reminder, the sixth hour is high noon. It's noontime, right? It's the heat of the day. So we find Jesus here in this story sitting by a well, and he's weary, but he's waiting while he's weary, and he's waiting for the woman who is approaching out there in the distance, coming toward him in the heat of the day. And we continue now in John chapter 4, uh, verses 7 through 8. It says this, 
the woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. I want to spend some time today talking about how the Samaritan woman arrived at the well this day. When she arrives at the well that day, she has no clue that Jesus is waiting for her. She has no clue who he is, right? But when she arrives at the well that day, she's obviously thirsty. She's physically thirsty. It's noon. It's the heat of the day. She needs to get the water to satisfy her physical thirst. She arrives spiritually thirsty because Jesus is going to awaken that need for her of her spiritual thirst in this conversation. She arrives socially thirsty. She has no female friends. She's all alone. We'll discover her story as we journey through. And she's relationally thirsty, right? She's a failure at love six times over, which brings us to the next thing I wanted to highlight is she arrives at the well that day a failure. Now, we're going to learn as we go through the course of this story that this woman has failed at love six different times. She's failed at five marriages, and now she's currently living with a man she's not married to. It's easy to read a sentence like that and just sort of get the information and move beyond it. But I want to pause here, and I want you to think about this. Imagine what it must have been like for her to fail at marriage number one. It was devastating. She got married, and she got divorced. Then, she's still hopeful. She goes out and finds another man and she gets married again and gets divorced. She gets married a third time. That marriage ends in failure. She gets divorced. She gets married a fourth time. That marriage fails. That marriage ends in divorce. She gets married a fifth time. Five times. That marriage fails. That marriage ends in divorce. And by this point, she's such a failure. She knows she's a failure. And so she doesn't even bother to get married to the guy she's living with currently. A sixth man. It also got me thinking, man, she's older by this point, right? She's no spring chicken anymore. Five failed marriages take time. And along the way, whatever beauty she had, Whatever attractive features she had, they've certainly started to fade after five different husbands and buried beneath the wrinkles of middle age and mountains of disappointment and heartache. Which reminds us that she shows up at the well this day hurting, broken, whether she realized it or not. Over decades, this woman hewed out for herself, chiseled out for herself, a broken cistern in her life that held no water. Now, what do I mean by that? In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, uh, the Lord is speaking and He says, Hey, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, which Jesus is going to refer to Himself in this story as living water, by the way, and hewed out for hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. How much value is a broken cistern that can hold no water? Like, put it this way. uh, We love having our hydro flasks or our water bottles. Mine has tea in it today. But if it doesn't hold anything, if it doesn't hold any water, and it's broken and just whatever you pour in there just leaks out all over the place, of what value is it? What good is it? It's worthless. And listen, our best efforts, our best attempts at trying to figure out life and and figure out the meaning of life and live a correct way, the best we can do, all we can do is just hew out for ourselves, which is a lot of labor, by the way. It's talking about cutting cutting it out of stone, right? It's, It's labor intensive. But at the end of the day, all of our best efforts, that all they can do, Yield us a broken cistern that holds no water, something that's worthless. Also, we realize that as this woman rolls up, Jesus speaks to her. 
And he broke societal boundaries and he spoke to her. He spoke to a woman who was cut off from society. And it reminds us that as we are out there sharing our faith, God is calling us to pursue the outcasts of society. People living on the margins like this Samaritan woman. Now imagine in the story, Jesus is sitting there by himself, the Bible says, in the heat of the day. He's watching this Samaritan woman approach from a distance. She has no idea whatsoever that her life is about to change forever. Now, when she rolls up to the well that day, she didn't arrive to the well that day seeking the Lord. She just was coming for water. No, but Jesus pursued her. God pursues us also. The Bible tells us that God is waiting for us. He desires to meet with us, just like he waited for this woman at the well. Jesus wants to meet with you, with me personally, every single day. And we need to come to the well of his living water. Also, when Jesus rolls up, he's all alone with this woman. And he initiates the conversation. Do you? Do I, when we're out seeking to share our faith, are we willing to get beyond our comfort zone and initiate the conversation? He spoke to this woman outside of societal boundaries, outside of the norm, and even on her turf, too. Verse 9. We're going to see the woman's response. Jesus said, give me a drink. Here's her response. The woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Now, when you're out there sharing your faith uh, with people who don't yet know Christ, you're going to discover that along the way there's going to be a clash of culture. Right? Differences in culture are often obstacles initially. I mean, it's obvious from a missionary standpoint. Like, if you're going to go to a foreign country and invest in the lives of people that have a completely different culture, a completely different language, obviously you need to familiarize yourself with the culture so you can more effectively share Christ with them. But as we share Christ with just people that we know and live with and work around and are in our families, uh, sometimes when you try to share Christ with them, there's a difference in the way they were grown up. There's a difference in what they've been taught. There's a difference in what they believe. And so there can be a clash of those cultures. Now, specifically speaking, why was it that Jews and Samaritans hated one another? Because that's what's being highlighted here. And it's not just a little hate. These two cultures hate each other's guts. Where did that hatred come from? Why is it so significant? Why would this woman bring it up? Well, for a more thorough understanding of the issue between the Samaritans and the Jews, I want to encourage you. Just take the time to read 2 Kings chapter 17. That's 2 Kings 17. Ezra chapter 4 also highlights some of those reasons. And Nehemiah chapter 6. That's Nehemiah chapter 6. But for now, here's the Reader's Digest or the Instagram version. Who were the Samaritans? Well, they were a half-breed group of people who occupied the country of Israel, formerly belonging to the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, and it was wedged right in the middle of Israel itself. Judah down in the south, Judea down in the south, Samaria right here in the middle, and on top of it, the Galilee region. Now, the capital city of Samaria uh, was, or the capital city of their region was Samaria. And in the Old Testament, the ten northern tribes of Israel had rebelled against God, And they were conquered by the king of Assyria, and they were taken away into captivity. Uh, Though many of the poor Israelites, the undesirables, they were left behind. Then the king of Assyria sent foreigners from his land to settle uh, the land of Israel that he had conquered. And these settlers arrived, and they began to intermarry with the Jews. So they became a half-breed culture, half-Jew, half-Jew, and half uh, Assyrian. Okay, And along the way, these Samaritans 
were instructed by a Jewish priest who was sent back by the king of Assyria to try to help the people understand the God of that region because they didn't worship those gods. And so this priest came back and he began to instruct them. And so the Samaritans became a mix of Jewish-based beliefs on the five books of Moses, so Genesis through Deuteronomy only, and then a myriad of other idolatrous practices from Assyria as well. So first of all, they're half-breed. They're not pure Jew, and they've got a mixture of their faith. But why the hatred between the cultures, and where did it arise? Well, the Jews, after their return from their 70-year captivity in Babylon, they began to rebuild the temple. Now, these are purebred people sent back to rebuild the kingdom of Israel. And while Nehemiah was engaged in building the walls of Jerusalem, the Samaritans vigorously opposed and attempted to stop the building of both the walls of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount as well. That didn't go over very well. Also, in the Jews' absence, the Samaritans decided, oh, we're going to build the, the temple on the proper place, which is Mount Gerizim, which is totally false according to Scripture. And they designated that as the place that Moses told the people they were supposed to worship, which it wasn't. But that's what they believed. That's a big problem when you're a Jew and a Samaritan, opposing spots of worship. Also, uh, Samaria became a sanctuary state for outlaws. Uh, if there was a Jew who was, got in trouble there in Israel, they would flee to a place of safety in Samaria. And so there was hatred and discord in regards to that. And then finally, uh, the Samaritans only believed in the five books of Moses. Genesis through Deuteronomy. And they rejected, therefore, all the writings, uh, the historical writings. So that's uh, Joshua Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. They rejected uh, Psalms. They rejected Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. They rejected Isaiah all the way through Malachi. They rejected all of those books. And so as a result, discord. Now, for these reasons, over the centuries, there arose severe hatred between the two cultures, so much so that the Jews considered Samaritans the lowest life form of humanity. The lowest life form of humanity. Now, when this Samaritan woman rolls up that day, she's so tied up in what is familiar to her that she can't think that Jesus is truly interested in speaking with her. Now, although Jesus is acting without prejudice, she fires back with all the labels, with all the stereotypes, right? And it got me thinking that we need to understand that as we try to share our faith in Christ with people who don't yet know the Lord, first of all, we'll be uncomfortable because we'll be outside of our comfort zones. But listen, they're going to be uncomfortable too. This woman was uncomfortable with Jesus' approach. Initially, she's like, what are you doing? Why are you talking to me? Sometimes when you try to bring up the gospel with other folks, they too will be uncomfortable. Verse 10, now Jesus is going to respond to her, to her question about Jews and Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, first of all, I want you to understand something. Jesus didn't have a set pattern that he used for sharing truth with people. Let's just roll back a little bit to uh, John chapter 3 for a second. When Jesus talked to Nicodemus, he talked to him about, hey, Nicodemus, you must be born again. But now with the Samaritan woman, he begins to talk to her about the need to receive the gift of God and living water. So Jesus didn't use the same message, the same approach every single time, right? There was a difference. There was a individualized need in the moment. But however, just because there was a different need, uh, Jesus still took the time to communicate. And we need to initiate conversations with people. Jesus asked her questions. He interacted with her. Listen to me. Jesus didn't just simply pray and hope that somehow the Samaritan woman magically came to understand the truth. He engaged her in conversation. He pursued her. 
He shared the truth with her. Listen, you and I, we need to leave behind the comfort of our own walls and engage people on the outside. Also, you'll notice here that Jesus found connecting points between her story and his story. Something that was a common a commonality for both of them. In this case, it's water. Right? They're both there at the well because they're thirsty. They're both there at the well because they need water. And so he used water as a way to open up a conversation about himself as the living water. So a connecting point between your story and their story. When you share Jesus with others, specifically ask God and say, Lord, reveal to me a connecting point between their story and my story. A a common ground from which I can begin to unveil the truth of you, Jesus. Also, notice the woman, right? She throws a bomb. Why are you talking to me? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. You're a man. I'm a woman. But Jesus doesn't get sidetracked by her comment. He continued to pique her interest. As we witness with other people, we too will need to remain committed and not give up. Verse 11 through 12. Now the woman responds. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw the water with. The well's deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well. He drank it from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. (laughs) Now, sometimes when you begin to try to talk to people about Jesus Christ, you're going to notice that they're a little bit crusty about it. This woman was crusty because she's been wounded. And people that we visit with and share Christ with are packing around wounds, hurts that are covered over by crusty scars. And sometimes they'll just fire back with things to try to sidetrack the conversation or to get you to quit or to get you to leave them alone. Also, this woman, she challenges Jesus. She comes with her excuses. And people make excuses. Right? They've, some people you try to talk to about their faith, it's like they almost have a, just a, an excuse just waiting there, just immediately so that they can fire it up. The Samaritan woman was quick to challenge Jesus, uh, seeking to change the subject. Uh, but does Jesus quit on her? Did Jesus quit? Did he just go, oh, I'm sorry, that was a little crusty. Oh, you challenged me. I think I'll, mm, I tried. Man, thank God Jesus pursued her and he pursues us even though we're crusty, even though we challenge him, even though we don't want him. He still pursued us and he's calling us to pursue others. Last, we see here that Jesus takes the time to clarify. First, this woman is asking for clarity. She asks a couple questions and then Jesus, as we see the story unfold, will take the time to clarify those questions for her. He'll answer them. And I also like here with the, with the woman. She takes the time to ask her question. Man, God is okay with you asking questions. How are you ever supposed to get answers if you never ask the question? Ask somebody that, that does know Jesus, that does follow Jesus, if you have questions about Jesus, in hopes that you can get answers for those questions. If you never ask, you won't get them. Now, in the few verses as we go through John chapter 4 over the next couple weeks, we're going to see Jesus plainly clarify and answer both of her questions. Question number one, she asked, where do you get that living water? We're going to see that Jesus is going to answer and say later on in the story, from myself. He's going to say, I am living water. Then, to her second question, are you greater than our father Jacob? Toward the very end of this conversation with the woman, Jesus is going to clearly answer and tell her, I am. I am the living water. I am God. I am the Messiah. All right, verse 13. Jesus said to her, here's his response back. You get the dialogue going back and forth here in the conversation. Everyone who drinks this water, the water in the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. 
First, the living water that Jesus is offering, he says, is for everyone who wants it. Notice the similarity with John chapter 3, verse 16, when he was speaking with Nicodemus, saying, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. Here he speaks about this woman. He says, hey, whoever drinks of this living water, right, will never thirst again. And listen, he is inviting you and me to drink of his living water. Now, Jesus says regarding the the water in that well, that, yeah, you'll drink it, but you'll be thirsty again. Yeah, I can have a drink here of my tea, right? And I'll I'll be thirsty again. But Jesus said he's offering something that will satisfy our complete thirst. Listen, regarding the wells of this world, the water that this world offers, not the physical water, but the places where we look for satisfaction, the wells of this world provide temporary satisfaction. But in the end, every single time, They leave us dry, exhausted, and empty every single time. It's because the world only offers broken cisterns. They don't hold any water. Anne Graham Lotz put it this way in her book, Just Give Me Jesus. Speaking of the wells of this world and identifying the different wells that we look to for satisfaction, she said, All those who look to draw their satisfaction from the wells of the world, now she'll list them, pleasure, popularity, position, possessions, politics, power, prestige. How about your career, your children, your church, the clubs you belong to? Ah, okay, what about sports or sex? Or success. Maybe it's about recognition for you. Or reputation. Or religion. Or education. You'll get lots of education. That's where you'll find your success. Entertainment. Exercise. Honors. Health. Hobbies. All of those wells of this world will leave you thirsty again. Jesus, though, said he's different. Jesus said he isn't a limited resource. You never use up your eight fluid ounces, <laughs> your eight fluid ounce servings of Jesus. You never reach the end, you know? Maybe you have a favorite uh, kind of candy or thing that you have there in a bag in your house, and you reach into that bag and you're like, ah, it's, it's empty. It's the last one. There is no more. I've used up my allotment, man. We never have that happen to us with Jesus. He is unlimited living water. All we're invited to do is just keep drinking. It's the difference between that water bottle there, which you will quickly exhaust if you take the time to drink, and this waterfall. And Jesus is saying, hey, I'm like the waterfall. I'm living water. All you can do, man, just get underneath me. Just drink me up. Just absorb me. It is limitless supply in Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, speaking of Jesus and salvation, it says this, With joy, with joy, you will draw water from the well of salvation you'll draw with joy you can draw water from the well of salvation why joy when i come to the well of salvation because i find that jesus is there waiting for me this woman rolls up to the well and jesus is there waiting for her for her who is jesus the bible says the meaning of jesus's name is salvation With joy, you'll draw water from the wells of salvation. Man, every single time I come to Jesus, every single time I spend time in his word, I always leave refreshed. I always leave excited and filled up and empowered by the God who loves me because he meets me there and there is no way to exhaust it. It's inexhaustible. It's living water. Verse 15. Here's the woman's response to Jesus. She said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. 
Now, the woman came back with a logical response. Maybe she just wanted an easier life, right? Not having to draw water every day, that'd be good. Or maybe bragging rights, rubbing it in the face of the other women who had to roll out every morning in the evening to go get water. Or maybe just to avoid criticism, because she was hated for her reputation. Listen, some people only want Jesus to enhance their lives instead of redeem it. They want to be more comfortable. And so they come to Jesus initially thinking Jesus will just make their life more comfortable rather than seeking actual redemption of their soul. But I have good news for us, though. Good news for all of us. Even though the woman requested living water for the wrong reasons, she's requesting it here. But even though it was probably for the wrong reasons, guess what? Jesus gave it to her anyway. Jesus gave it to her anyway. However, for Jesus to give her what she requested, she said, sir, give me this water. Jesus knows that there's still, he knew that there's still one thing standing in the way of her receiving that water, and that thing that was standing in the way for her was her sin. We see Jesus highlight it in verse 16. So Jesus responded and said to her, Go call your husband and come here. Now, before we can receive Christ's gift of eternal life, we must admit our sinfulness. Out of love for her. Again, it's out of love. Jesus took the time to uncover the only thing standing in the way of her redemption. It was her sin. Listen. As we share our faith in Christ with other people, at some point, they, they need to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, come to a place, reach a place, where they are convicted for their sin. Sin must be addressed. And so it's out of tremendous love that God convicts us of it. It's out of love that he carefully uncovers the truth of our rebellion, so much so that when I feel convicted by God, when you feel convicted by God, man, it's like you're just standing there naked and ashamed over what you've done. And rightfully so, because we should be ashamed. Sin is shameful. Uh, the word conviction has a profound double meaning. First, it means a fixed or a firm belief. A fixed or a firm belief. Second, it also means a declaration that someone is guilty of an offense. They're guilty. They've done wrong. When we confess our sin, when we confess our sin, it's that kind of conviction that God is seeking to produce in our life. He wants us to firmly, firmly believe that we are guilty of offending God and that we stand convicted and deserve God's righteous judgment. Listen, I am a sinner, and outside of God, I stand completely convicted, and rightly so, because I have offended God. Listen, if God does not convict you and me of our sin, we will never, we will never confess it or be forgiven for it. It must be addressed. So conviction, we see, eventually leads to, if properly received, confession. Confession of our personal sin is essential. Now the word confession, guess what it means? It means to admit or accept responsibility for a crime or an, an offense. To admit or accept responsibility for a crime or an offense. When we confess our sin, we don't just admit it, we own it. I'm the one who did it. This is my offense. We agree with God about what we have done wrong. So conviction leads to confession. Owning our sin. And then we discover that confession leads to cleansing. Cleansed by what? Not by what so much, but by who? By Jesus. 
our living water being washed over us. And in so doing, as we are convicted by God's Spirit and we confess and we're in agreement with God as the Spirit is at work in our lives, then we are cleansed and forgiven for our sin and our sins are washed white as snow. 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, if we admit and agree with God about what we have done wrong, here's God's promise to you, God's promise to me. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, <laughs> forgiveness, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Man, it just reminded me here of this guy standing underneath a waterfall, right? Man, that's what it's like. That's what Jesus is inviting us to. In the midst of our sin, in the midst of we have uh, offended God, God is saying, listen, come to me and just let me wash over you. Let me just wipe you clean, wash you clean. That's what he was inviting this woman into. That's why he addressed the sin in her life. Because he wanted her to be cleansed. He wanted her to be forgiven. He wanted her to be redeemed. Now, if we're going to talk about this idea of conviction and confession and cleansing, let's put it this way. The greatest commandment in the Bible that's listed, Jesus himself confirmed it, is that we are to love God completely with all that we are. We discover it in Mark chapter 12, verse 29. Jesus is answering a young man who asks, what's the most important commandment? Jesus said, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Now, if the greatest commandment that God wants us to keep is to love Him with all that we are, then logically speaking, the greatest sin that I can commit is when I love anything or anyone more than God. Since the greatest command is to love the Lord with all that I am, the, the greatest sin then logically would be when I love anyone or anything more than God. The Samaritan woman, she loved men. She loved the idea of romance more than God. My question to us today is, what or who do we love more than God? Listen, if you're hearing this right now and you feel convicted, what is that evidence of? God's love for you. God's love for you. He's convicting you. Why? Because he wants you to confess it, to own it, to be in agreement with him about it. Why? So that he can cleanse you from it. Redeem you, set you free from it. Verse 17 through 18, the woman will respond... The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying I have no husband. You've had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. <laughs> Whew. Can you imagine? First, I believe it's important here to pause and recall that until Jesus lovingly revealed the truth to her, this woman was enslaved in her sin. It's all she knew. She didn't know any better. If she was able to deliver herself from it, she would have a long time ago, right? Second, notice that she confessed only a half-truth. It was true that she wasn't married. It's true. But she knew full well it wasn't the whole story. So Jesus, out of love for this woman takes what she had covered up and just rips the covers clean off, leaves her feeling exposed. How does Jesus know that about her? She didn't say it. Well, because Jesus, he knows all things. He is God. And Jesus knew her sordid story, and her sordid story did not scare him off. Listen. This is really good news for you and for me. Our sordid story, mine is, listen, if you're honest, yours is too. 
It doesn't scare Jesus off. Your sin does not scare Jesus off. He knows it already. And he's still pursuing you. Why? Because he loves you. Why is he revealing your sin to you and convicting you of your sin? Oh, because he just simply wants you to confess it. Why? Oh, so you can be cleansed. Listen, it's not enough to only admit half the truth to Jesus. He wants it all. He will bring the whole sin to the surface. Jesus knows everything about us, including our deepest and darkest secrets. And amazingly enough, he still wants a relationship with us. He still wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with people that you know that are yet outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that our Savior, that Jesus Christ the Lord, did not look at our story and say, whoa, that person, mm, they are too far gone. Instead, he's waiting for us. Sitting there at the well, watching us walk up, excited to engage in conversation with us so that we might be redeemed. And listen, he's inviting you and me to learn how to share our faith with other people who don't yet know him so that they too can be convicted out of love, can be, reach a place of confession uh, because the Spirit is at work in their life and ultimately be cleansed from their sin, just like you, just like me. Let's be faithful to share with other people the love that God has already shared to us. Father, Thanks for this time together today in your word. Thank you for being willing to, out of love, convict us so that we might simply confess, so that we might be cleansed. And Lord, as you pursued this woman, God, I pray, God, that you would ignite in us a desire to share our faith with people who do not yet know the truth about you. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Um, we in encourage you to continue coming back. I'm excited about sharing the next section here uh, in John uh, chapter 4 in the weeks to come. God bless you.